voice of freedom. You're listening to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. Cooper, and you're listening to the Hour of the Time. Ladies and gentlemen, when I awoke this morning, my voice was gone. By taking it easy and uh, doing the right things today, it has come back. But believe me, I'm forcing it right now to sound better than it really does. And so tonight, we're going to go back to the conference, and specifically the date of August the 21st, and you're going to hear the beginning two hours of Michelle Moore's lecture following the field trip to the desolation that is the site where the Nura Federal Building once stood. We are back in the conference room now, and... Uh, if I were you, I would pay very close attention to the next two hours. And if I feel like it, we may go another two hours on satellite. Cross your fingers, because I may not feel like it. Don't go away, folks. You'll want to hear every single word of this. And remember to call Swiss America Trading and thank them for sponsoring this broadcast and for backing the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. As for the current newsletter... If you listened last night, you know that you can no longer put this call off. You must call Swiss America Trading, and you must get your hands on some real money. You must do it very soon. 1-800-289-2646. It's 1-800-BUY-COIN. 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-BUY-COIN. Wow. What in the world happened there? I'll never know. So I'll try that again. And I'll even give myself my cue. 1 800 buy coin. Bring it on! <laughs>
and the federal building, I mean, and the federal courthouse sit is known as Block 39. And it was originally owned by the Masons. And then, and they also, the uh, General Record Building was the Masonic Temple. And the India Shrine shared it for a while, big auditorium there. Uh, and then in the 1930s, they lost their downtown holdings because of the Great Depression. Then they bought them back just in time for the building to blow up and to collect the big money grant from the government. So that was all Masonic property, the land. Uh, as far as we can tell, uh, there's a real interesting story on trying to find the land deeds there. Um, we know for sure that the Fed never got it. The Fed never owned the land underneath the federal building. That's a definite given. But instead of saying that that gave state jurisdiction to the whole case, they said, oh, well, it's concurrent jurisdiction. Feds and state both can prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, so it's, it's a real mess. They're not even going to address that question. And uh, the real estate records are scarce as him to you could get them last November. You can't lay hands on them now. I don't know. Thank you. Pardon me? The Masons? Well, we'll be able to look that up. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, I had one presentation planned up until about midnight last night. But I've been talking to a lot of you here and realized that I needed to kind of change my approach because I've got a lot of people who were here last year and some people who weren't here last year but wanted to be here last year and now they want to know what I said last year. And I mean, so we got to kind of find a balance. <coughs> there are several things that you will immediately notice when you see the bomb site if you were down there. First of all, with the tremendous compassion of the people, uh, how they feel about the event and how they identify with it. You know, all the different states and countries. You know, you go along and you see the stuff from Australia and Kentucky and Tennessee and all these different places. People come from all over to go and be sad. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, difficult to determine what they're really sad about, um, but it's an oppressive place. It's a very spiritually dark and heavy place for me to be there. And I know that... Uh, when we were out there and I was trying to answer questions, I had this really strange moment when I heard the sound of my own voice coming back. I don't even know who I was talking to, and I just thought, boy, you really sound bitchy. <laughs> but it, it, it's just that I can't be there anymore, okay? It's a, I can't be there anymore. So it's, it's difficult. And then the other thing you notice when you're down there, when you look at the fence decor, is a tremendous amount of propaganda surrounding the event. All the stuff about wouldn't it be wonderful if there was no violence in the world? And uh, everything for the sake of the children. We'll give up our liberty so the children can have peace tomorrow. All the Masonic stuff we saw. Uh, I guess I talked to a lot of you. We went and looked at a lot of the stuff on the uh, fence. See, the evidence has been removed. The building's gone. And... Uh, one of the most obvious things is that the Murrah building is gone, but the Journal Record building, the Water Resources Board, the Athenian restaurant still stand. And if you went over to the fence and looked close up, you know that if you crossed over the fence and got in there, you'd be instantly hurt. Something would cave in on you. I don't know what's holding those things up. They're just in crumbles and wrinkles. <laughs> There's a wrinkle still. And yet, for some reason, they had to get rid of the Murrah building real fast. But those things are still standing, unrepaired. The reason that they gave for bringing down the Murrah building so fast was safety. Please. Yes, did you have a question? Oh, it looked like you were raising your hand. If anybody, uh, that's kind of a rough part of downtown, especially after dark. And, and there are guys and gangs and homeless people and drunks and prostitutes and stuff that walk the streets of downtown in that area. And if anybody got over the fence into one of those areas, they would undoubtedly be killed. But those buildings didn't need to be uh, bulldozed for safety's sake. You know, it's just very, very strange that that's not being addressed because obviously neither one of the, of the Athenian restaurant or the Water Resources Board building could be restored. Okay, they couldn't take what's there and make it back into anything habitable. That's obvious. 
the only solution to fixing those two particular buildings in question is to just scrape them, get rid of them, and start from the ground up. That's all they can do there. So why they're still standing, I don't know. They can bicker about the $39 million from now till eternity, right? But those, they, the remains don't need to still be there. But they are. Maybe. It's, it's, a, it's a, a big point of contention. That's what James Loftus said, that they could have, you know, he was uh, the head of the design team. He did say at one time in the paper very early on that he thought the destroyed part of the Murrah building could have been taken away and uh, what was left standing could have been built upon. Yes, Jane. Mm -hmm. And tornado. Right. And isn't it interesting that four weeks later he changed his opinion? Yeah. He was quite certain that it could be restored. But that was also a real emotional thing, too, because folks didn't want it restored. And the people who lived and were going to have to go back to work there didn't want to go back to anything that reminded them visually of where they had been and what had occurred. So there was a lot of psych psychology playing in on this thing. Um, the propaganda about the right-wing extremism, it has really, really gotten out of hand. And I'm not sure what we're going to do to counteract it. But this particular book is called... Criminal Justice and Right-Wing Extremism in America is published by John J. Nutter, Ph.D., by the Conflict Analysis Group. This is a handbook that was given to law enforcement trainees at a special seminar that was held earlier this year dealing with counterterrorism measures. And it goes through here and defines the profile of the terrorists. We all fit it, okay? And uh, in listing right-wing extremist dates and anniversaries, we have, of course, 1995, April 19th, right-wing extremists blow up Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, killing 169 people in the worst terrorist incident on U.S. soil. This is now fast. This is what they're teaching the police force. Typology of current right-wing extremists. It goes through neo-Nazi, Ku Klux Klan, Christian identity, skinheads, militias, sovereignty movement, constitutionalists, wise youth movement, county movement, tax protesters and resistors, Second Amendment groups. All terrorists and all these terrorists blew up the murder building and they're teaching this as truth. It's nuts. Criminal justice and right-wing extremism in America, John J. Nutter. Pardon me? John J. Nutter and the Conflict Analysis Group are teaching it to law enforcement. Is Danny back? Danny, was, at, was he at the seminar where this was taught? When he was doing his uh, detective? No, he wasn't. He got the, uh, yeah, he got the copy for me. Council on Law Enforcement Education and Training, Oklahoma Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. That's who this is for. And he's doing these seminars all over the country. I th can I get copies of this? Uh, well, mailboxes, etc. has three cent copy sale for the rest of the month. We could probably do it. It's not for a it, The page is not numbered. But it, you do well to have a copy of it. If, coordinate with Brett on that, okay? Would you see what needs to be done on that? The facts that we're looking at about the event. Two explosions. The interior explosion first. The fascia blown outwardly from deep inside the building. The survivor elm that you all saw is directly in the path of the blast, but it survives. Those lampshades that we looked at in the photographs, they're unharmed. And the crater evidence. Okay, um, Cal, would you put up the black and white deal for me, please? Uh, we need to focus. Oh, I better take this with me.
Uh, it's upside down. Uh, now, whoa, okay. <laughs> no, it's still not right. Well, put the crater down at the bottom. Do it this way. No, turn it up, yeah. Now turn it around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. This is a transparency made from an Associated Press laser photo, aerial photo. And this was taken on the day of the bombing before they covered anything up. This, right here, is the crater. So you can see it in relation to the building, but you're, always, you're looking at it at an odd angle. Because it looks, when you're looking at it, like it's way down here on the east side of the big cutout part. When we... That magazine that you brought me yesterday. When you go back to the table, there's a, a book or something with a lot of color photos in it. You can see the crater from a different angle, but still in front. And it's it's really like in this area here. I don't know what the angle is to make it look like this. But it wasn't at the right corner. And we all know that it was not at the right corner. Just an odd angle. But the reason this was an important photograph was because it gave us our first indication of what the diameter of the crater was. Now put that colored one up. That's, that's the photograph. Uh, let's see. Flip it over. There we go. This is the crater. This bucket, all these yellow buckets, yellow buckets, it's hard for me to see up close. Yeah, right. All of the, well, there's over here too, on this, there's more yellow buckets. They're 14 inches tall, okay? This is hardly a 30 foot crater. It's also not 8 or 12 feet deep. This was the first, honest to God, crater photograph close up inside the perimeter we'd ever been able to get. And it was taken by uh, one of the guys that works for Midwest Elevator Company that went in and, and did the elevator work and told us that none of the elevators free fell at all. So the BATF guy who was supposed to have fallen in the elevator five stories was lying. None of the elevators fell. But he took this photograph, and I know Bill has measured and I have measured a hundred different times bucket width <laughs> across it. And depending on where you measure it from, it's anywhere between 18 and 23 feet maximum. Maximum. That's being really generous to get 23 feet out of the crater. Now think about your 22 foot cargo truck blowing up. The cargo truck would barely fit in the crater. Just barely. And if it's going to do a gigantic blast, big enough to take down the whole front of the building and pancake nine stories, surely it would have made a much bigger crater than that. But that's the crater. And when you saw all of the uh, plywood, you know the photographs of the plywood that said the crater's underneath the plywood? The crater's not underneath the plywood. The crater's to the left of the plywood, and you can see it. And the crater just kind of got filled in as they went along. It wasn't so deep that they couldn't get across it. Nobody was in danger of falling in and, you know, headlong 20 feet down or 12 feet down and getting really hurt. As they moved the rubble out, it just kind of filled. So it was real interesting. They'd had the plywood over the crater all those weeks. The weekend before the building was imploded, Stephen Jones for the defense team takes his independent investigators inside the perimeter to do their one-hour uh, trip but they were allowed to look inside. Um, and the crater that was supposed to be underneath the plywood was miraculously filled. But there never was a crater underneath the plywood. So all of the talk about, you know, Stephen Jones saying, well, if they filled it in after I filed my motion, I'd be very disturbed. <laughs> I'd be a little upset about that. That was never the point. They had the, the public in their mind had the crater in the wrong place all along, and I'm not sure what the point of the deception was. If they have plywood over there, it's just to ease ingress and egress. So it's really lumpy. You know, lots and lots of debris and broken glass and dangerous stuff to walk across. Just makes it easy to get in and out for the rescuers and clean up. But they weren't covering up any big old crater that anybody was going to fall in and get hurt. Because that's the crater. Sir. Right. 
Right. No, no official, excuse, no official ever did say the crater was under the plywood. Well, now, wait a minute. In the FEMA footage, Mike Shannon, a firefighter, was asked by the cameraman, and where is the crater? And what he said was, over there, and gestured toward the plywood. But he didn't say, it's under the plywood. So that's about as close as we got. Brett? Right. Right. So that's the crater story. Now, I want to, see, I'm not going to spend the whole day talking about the bombing. we got training to do, but these are some things that I wanted to touch on that we didn't get to deal with last year and uh, things that I think are important. Um, you can take that one down now. I'm done with the crater. Let's talk about Gary Hunt and accomplice. Um, We've now confirmed from four eyewitnesses the presence of Gary Hunt at the Grand Continental Hotel for the entire week prior to the bombing. Uh, and also seen in the company of someone resembling McVeigh and somebody resembling John Doe too. Which means we now have McVeigh in two different states at one time and three different cities at one time. We've got lots of McVeighs running around. But the Gary Hunt issue is particularly um, interesting to study because it kind of reveals who the bad guys are. Now, I don't know why they're uh, trying to, I don't know why they're trying to keep Gary Hunt out of it when we can prove that Gary Hunt was there, but they're still trying to do it and they will be exposed. But what I'm going to show you now, uh, I'll run it a couple of times, is just a few seconds of footage from the KFOR, KFOR video and you'll see Gary Hunt and his friends walk around the bushes, come right in front of the camera, kind of look at it, and then move off. And I'll run it back and let you see it a couple of times so you see who this guy is. You think, who you? Gary Hunt is the, uh, is the one with the beard in this video. And you'll see that both have a little kind of a cheeky, skilty look on their face. Uh-oh, we walked right into a camera. Yeah. Now what do we do? Yeah. Right. 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 Do 
Oh, no. Of course not. We come across most of the evidence that we have gathered from the actual unseen video footage that has not had time to be censored or controlled by the nature of the establishment media. All of the reports that you initially get in some kind of incident like this, or any kind of a major disaster or confrontation or law enforcement action, the initial reports are always usually the most factual and contain the most usable information. After that, when the news becomes controlled, all of the truth begins to disappear. And we reach a point where nothing is the truth from that point on. Yes. Plus, the one on the left, have you ever had a lip reader? Yes. No. He comes in and tries to see what he's saying. No, I've never seen him. No, I've never seen him. He says something. Watch. Ready? Yeah. Now look. And then he asks. Uh oh. What's interesting to me is that the Discovery Channel did a special about survivalists of militia who brought the bombing in, and this footage was it. And CNN did a review of terrorist incidents not too long ago. I looked at the Olympic bombing, or in preparation for the Olympic bombing, and this footage was in it. They throw it in our face. And I'm even trying to hide this. We know who this guy is, and it's showing up in mainstream propaganda media now. Where did you go with this? KFOR Cameraman. Yeah. This is the unedited stuff, and then they edit it down to make the report that up. But of course, this little chunk never made it into an official report until, you know, a year after. And I don't know if CNN knows what they put in their view all over the Discovery Channel, but they're sure in there. You know who the other guy is? No. I just told you who he is. Well, he's talking. He said, God, stir up something in the name. Yeah, what are you doing? So, the known accomplice of Gary Cut, who's been with them elsewhere, I'm trying to stir up incidents. Now, the reason Gary Hunt is important is because of John Cash's reaction to Gary Hunt being revealed as being on the scene. Um, last October, get, get, would you close that back door of somebody, please, all the way? Yeah, it doesn't need to be locked because the kids need to get in, but it does need to be closed, please. Brought to you by Swiss America Trading. Please call 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-BUY-COIN. Thank them for sponsoring this broadcast. Ask them for the latest newsletter. Find out how you can get your hands on some real money. Real money. Money. As defined in the Constitution for the United States of America and in the law. Not that counterfeit crap that you carry in your pocket now. 1-800-289-2646. Do it now, ladies and gentlemen. You know how you are. There's confusion, but I don't know why. But I've made my plans already. And it's trouble in all my life. Come on. 
Last October, Gary Hunt came into Oklahoma City for a secret press conference that was held in the home of Glenn Wilburn. The present at the press conference were Glenn, John Cash, Pat Briley, Arnold Hamilton of the Dallas Morning News, Bill Jasper of the New American, and that's all of the media that were there. At this press conference, Hunt was asked why he was here, why he was being brought in, and why he was meeting with the defense team. And his sort of flippant response was, um, we're going to try to embarrass the government because they should have interrogated me since I look so much like the man in the KFOR video. Well, he is the man in the KFOR video, okay? We knew that he was the man in the KFOR video but this was his story. While he was in Oklahoma, John Cash drove him to and from Elohim City twice at the expense of the defense team. We don't know what those visits were about. But after those visits occurred, then all of a sudden we have, we bring Richard Wayne Snell back into the picture and the bombing was a, a farewell present to him on the day of his execution in the Cummins Correctional Facility in Arkansas. Uh, we've got uh, Andrea Strassmeyer who's supposed to be connected with McVeigh because they stole the knife and traded some clothes at a gun show. Uh, McVeigh was supposed to have called him the week before the bombing. Uh, and as I allegedly, the story goes, was looking for shelter after he did the dirty deed. But if that was the case, he was headed in the wrong direction because he was going north on 35 and to get to Elohim City, you've got to go all the way east on 40 to Muldrow, which is practically to the Arkansas state line, and then go south. So if he was looking for shelter in Elohim City, which is a white supremacist, separatist, they are separatists, community, um, he was going the wrong way. <laughs> you know, then uh, we have Jim Ellison at Elohim City. And he's living there under the Federal Witness Protection Program. And his little deal was back in 1985, April the 19th, his little cult group in Bull Shoals, Arkansas area, known as the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, had a little run-in with the feds because certain members of the order, which is an extreme radical group, and they had done some murders and so forth, they robbed some banks, were hiding out there at the properties. And so the feds were going to raid it. And they did have lots and lots of guns, and they were trained, and, you know, they were big time into the gun scene. Sir? Connecticut. Is that right? Well, yeah, that's right. That's right. Do you remember the incident that occurred in Alabama? A couple of supposed patrons that flew into Oklahoma, Alabama, a husband and wife, and they had a confrontation with a cop there. And uh, they had some literature or whatever, and, and I think, you know, they shot the cop and killed him. And the cops uh, searched their motel room and came up with not racist stuff, which they put out, but apparently they came up with just If I'd thought about it before this morning, I would have brought it with me, but uh, Hunt also faxed over the Patriot Fax Network a fax on April the 19th saying what a good thing it was that the building had been blown up. Um, he thought that was great. Well, anyway, he was in Oklahoma City for this press conference, a secret press conference in October. On November the 6th, which was a Monday, I called Wilburn because I didn't know he'd been here. 
I didn't know Cash uh, Hunt had been here. And I called Glenn Wilburn, and I told him that we had positively ID'd Gary Hunt. And out of the clear blue, he says, oh, no, it's not him. We have found two workers on the maintenance staff of the Journal Record Building who are just the spitting image for Gary Hunt and his accomplice. I said, well, great. What are their names? Let me interview them. Got a phone number. Well, I'll have to get back to you on that. Never got back to me on that. That was the beginning of a big problem with Gary Hunt, and it was the real uh, revelation of the true character of John Cash. Now, does everybody in here know who John Cash is? Okay. John Cash is allegedly a freelance writer who blew into town between the 15th and 30th of June, 95, uh, with the excuse that he was going to do research to write a book about the bombing. He supposedly came out of the town of Idabel, which is in the far southeastern corner of Oklahoma. Uh, he supposedly had published some news stories in the, in the McAllister paper, and the Idabel paper, and so forth and so on. And he hitched his wagon right away to Representative Charles Key and Glenn Wilburn because they were the most visible and vocal at that time in asking the questions. And Cash showed up right about the time that Edie Smith was... You know, she made that big speech on the day of the implosion, where were all the BATF agents? And um, the BATF had been out to visit her in her home, and they'd been to see Glenn in his home, and gave him all these excuses about where everybody was. No, yeah, we had some guys that were hurt in the building, and it's okay, and we're not really trying to keep things from you, and blah, 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 blah. Here comes Cash. Nicest guy you're ever like, listen to meet. But slimy, I didn't like him instantly. And several other people I've talked to had that. It's just a subjective thing. You know, the, when I met John Cash in Charles Key's office, we shook hands, and my instant reaction was that I felt like I needed to go wash. Just oily kind of a guy. Reminded me of my one of the black sheep in my family, <laughs> one of my uncles. <laughs> well. On the following Monday, which would have been the, uh, let's see, the 6th, 11th was a Saturday. It would have been the 13th. No, on the 6th of November, the same night that I talked to Wilburn, Pat Briley, who is an independent investigator from Edmond, he's uncovered a lot of useful stuff and some equally kind of dumb stuff. You just kind of have to weigh it carefully. He's a real nice guy. He was scheduled to go on Tom Valentine's program and expose the Gary Hunt positive ID because he'd done the same thing. He did the body proportion, body measurement proportion comparison analysis to determine that that was Gary Hunt. Where you have certain measurements, you know, between the eyes, between, you know, all these different measurements of your face, that no matter how fat or thin you get, old or young you may be, those proportions, those ratios stay the same throughout your whole life. And that is a means of positive ID. Uh, no matter what physical state you may be in. And Hunt had been identified that way, and Briley knew how to do it, and he'd positively ID Hunt the same way. <coughs> he was scheduled to go on Tom Valentine's show and talk about this. John Cash got on the phone with Tom, said, we need to cancel this broadcast. We've got new information. It wasn't Gary Hunt. It was the maintenance man and his maintenance man friend. The maintenance man in the Journal Record building looks a lot like Gary Hunt, but it's not Gary Hunt, and it's definitely not the guy in the videotape. I don't know about the accomplice. I've never seen the accomplice. I've never seen a photograph of the accomplice. I don't know that there is an accomplice. But for the sake of the story, there has to be one. And I question what are the odds that on that day, at that time, in that place, you could get these two guys who look just like these two guys <laughs> just to be there casually walking up, working in the journal record building. The whole place is caved in, on fire, people are screaming and carrying on, the bombing is about a half an hour old, and they're just casually walking around the side of the building? I don't think so. With electronic transmitters. You got me. But every excuse Gary Hunt has given as to why he was not here has fallen through. He told Linda Thompson that he was up in Michigan. So Linda Thompson called all of her Michigan connections and said, no, I wasn't here. 
it became such a controversy that Tom Valentine invited Gary Hunt on his program because Gary Hunt said that John Stadmiller from Florida had spoken to him on the phone uh, in Florida and I don't remember where Hunt said he was calling from but Stadmiller was supposed to produce his phone records and this would prove that Hunt was not in Oklahoma. Stadmiller got on the phone and said, you never called me. There's nothing in my phone records. And Hunt's going, don't you remember we talked about this and this and this and this and this and that and that? Stadmiller says, no. You did not call me. There's nothing in my phone records. And it went back and forth and back and forth. We'll probably put the transcript of it in one of the volumes of the book because I've got it on tape. Amazing. But every alibi that Hunt's ever been able to come up with, no one will support him in it. And we know he was here. But for whatever reason, the feds don't want us to know he's here. John Cash doesn't want us to know he's here. Glenn Wilburn doesn't want us to know he's here. And everybody who tries to prove that he's here gets in big, bad trouble. Now, on November the 11th, that was a Saturday, Briley had rescheduled his program to be on Tom Valentine's show the following Monday. Again, we were going to talk about the Hunt thing because he'd gone back over the evidence and reconfirmed it, double-checked, blah, 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 and it was for real, and so he was going to try to expose this again. Tom calls Mr. Wilburn and Mr. Cash and tells him what the plans are for the next program because in those days, oh, you know, all the independent investigators were on Valentine's show all the time, you know, hooting and hollering about whatever theory they were working on at the time. And that show also was canceled. And that night, that Saturday night, Briley calls me three times. I've never had a phone conversation with Pat Briley that lasted shorter than an hour. And most of them were incredible marathons. Incredible marathons. We talked from first from 8 until 10. Then we talked from about 10.30 until 11.30. And then he calls me from a payphone because he'd gotten some threatening phone calls from John Cash threatening his life if he didn't drop the John Cash information. And so I told him to go back home to play me the messages on his phone box into my phone box so I could have them on tape and to call the cops and have them come out there and tell them the whole hunt story and everything and to leave the phone line open so I could take the interview with the police. And this he did. Are there any children in the room at all right now? Everybody's gone? Okay, I want you to hear the three phone calls. Oh, how young? The language is extremely bad. Wait, wait. It's coming. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Are we sure? Okay. It's, it's pretty profane, so I apologize in advance, but I didn't say it. This is two cash, two phone calls. From John Cash, five minutes apart, and the last phone call is Lynn Wilburn. Dad, say there is me again. Thursday, 8.33 a.m. It's coming. Okay. Well, Riley, why don't you quit hiding behind your wife and kids and get on the fucking phone? Come on, Brett Pat. Come on. Get on the fucking phone. If I have to ride to Edmund tonight, I'll do it if you don't get on the fucking phone. If you don't call me in ten fucking minutes, I'm heading your way. You've got ten minutes to call me, you cocksucker. Get on the phone. Come on. Come on, fat fucker. Get on the fucking phone. If you don't get on the phone in ten minutes, I'm heading your way. You got it? You got ten minutes to call me. of John Cash. He doesn't want anything out about Gary Hunt. 
Now, Pat Briley's wife works at Dillard's in the credit department, and she just happens to have two co-workers, one of whom is the wife of Don, uh, Dan Vogel, who's head honcho spokesman for the FBI in Oklahoma City, and the other one is the wife of John Hursley, who is the FBI agent who lied four or five times on the stand about the evidence concerning McVeigh. He's the one who came up there and said, oh, yeah, there was a, what is it, PETN, that uh, explosive powdery stuff on his shirt and all this other stuff. And it's his testimony primarily that Whitehurst, the whistleblower on the FBI labs, wants to expose as being falsified. So there's a lot of irons in the fire that all have to do with the FBI and John Cash and Gary Hunt and, in this case, Pat Briley. Because Pat's not working anywhere. He's got a long history of hassles with everybody he's ever been in contact with. And for whatever reason, doesn't hold work very regularly, but his wife does. And they're very much dependent on his income, and that's okay. But how she ended up working in the same office between two head honcho wives of head honcho FBI guys is beyond me. And what, what Cash was threatening Briley with was squeezing her out of a job. Let's see. And that means a lot for her to keep that job for them and their family. Well, Briley called the cops, told them all about Gary Hunt, told them all about the press conference, told them all about the trip to Elohim City, told them all about John Cash, blah, 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 blah. They took copious notes. The taped interview I have of them interviewing Pat goes on in excess of an hour. And they said, thank you very much, and they left. And the following Monday, uh, an Oklahoma City policeman shows up with an undercover FBI agent in tow to interview Briley again, and they bury the hunt information and will not discuss it. Uh, Briley has called him and called him and called him and called him because he's real past on the phone. You know. <laughs> says, uh, uh, he wants to force the conflict. He wants them to admit that Gary Hunt was there because he was there and Lincoln Curry was there, and they know he was there. But they're burying the entire incident. So the presence of Hunt there when you saw him must be really critical to something to someone hunt yeah. making trouble hunt is an undercover agent and a provocateur under the employ of the bureau of alcohol tobacco and firearms <laughs> Last December, from the 17th through the 21st, I did extensive, lengthy, I mean, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours interviews with James Nichols, his dad Robert, and Bob Popovich, their close friend, pal, mentor, neighbor. It was at that series of meetings so we all sat down in Chuck Allen's dining room table and put all the, get the John Cash pieces on the table. And I had information that he'd been in banking. He has no visible means of support. He came upon his money in a great hurry. He got out of banking just in time to participate in the, the property liquidations when the RTC came in to do the savings and loan, you know, fix all that stuff up collected a bunch of properties for pennies on the dollar, turned around and sold them, made a mint. John Cash had told Nichols when he went up to Michigan to see him, he says, well, I just wanted to tell you so you don't find out later and hold it against me, I'm a member of the CFR. He said, uh, I quit paying my dues in 1991, so I've dropped out, but just in case you found out about that later, I didn't want you to think that I'd withheld the information from you. You don't quit paying dues to the CFR and drop out. And it's not like the Boy Scouts, you know, swimming lessons where you get tired of it, you just stop going. This guy was groomed to be part of that organization, was invited to be part of that organization, and whether he paid or not is really immaterial. If they didn't remove him, he's in. So we've got that little piece of the puzzle. Now, wasn't the uh, savings and loan thing a CIA operation? Uh, 
That's John Cash. And now that Tom Valentine's off the air, you hear him more and more frequently speaking on Jeff Harder's program. He was on about, uh, my sense of time has been really weird for the past month, I guess about three weeks ago. And his story keeps changing. There's just lots and lots of changes in what Cash thinks is going on. But there's one main theme throughout. First, he wanted to tell us we had the Middle Eastern connection and he was all gung-ho on the KFOR John Doe number two story where it was supposed to be this uh, Middle Eastern guy named Ali Hussein Husseini. Well, that guy's story pretty much checked out. Now there's lawsuits flying for defamation of character and all that stuff. Then he wanted to bring Elohim City and the neo-Nazis in on it and Strassmeyer and Jim Ellison and Richard Wayne Snell and uh, so the white supremacists did it. And then he wanted the interior explosion of the Murrah building to have been accidental because the BATF had illegally stored explosives in the building. Um, and then he has come on to say that General Parton's evidence is all wrong. Were you waving your hand there? Oh, okay. But the cash is no expert at anything except lying. You know, he goes on the air and he talks about how, how wrong General Parton's information is. And he says, you know, the guy never went to explosive school. Well, there wouldn't be any explosive school if it hadn't been for Parton. You know, it's, it's just amazing. But the main thing he wants to do is to make sure that the second explosion, which they're eventually going to have to face, they cannot get away from the seismic evidence. It's beginning to weigh very, very heavily on them. So they're going to have to eventually come out and say, yes, yes, there was a second explosion, but it was a terrible accident. And this will explain the asymmetry in the damage to the building and uh, maybe a little criminal negligence or something, but certainly not murder. Oh, it didn't, it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. It wasn't an accident. And, of course, in the meantime, while he's telling this big tale, the BATF is saying, well, they were all inert. All those things with the hand grenades and all this sort of stuff that were up there, they were all inert training devices. <laughs> no comment. Glenn Wilburn is not the same Glenn Wilburn that I knew last year. And you'll be seeing him a lot in Patriot Shortwave as well. Now, I don't think either one of those guys has been on Jeff Baker yet. But with Tom Valentine gone, who have we got left? We've got Jeff Baker, we've got Bug Rides, we've got uh, Carter. Who are our other? A oh, corn key? Resnick? Uh, that's another story. <laughs> Thank you.
Just to recap a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, on what you heard for the last hour, just in case you may have missed it. When John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, he was assassinated in a Temple of the Sun upon the site of the first Masonic Lodge built in Dallas. When the Branch Davidians were murdered in Waco, Texas, it turns out that Waco is the home of the Grand Lodge of the state of Texas. The Grand Lodge of the Southern Jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. It now turns out that all of the land upon which the Mira Federal Building sits and the surrounding property is owned. Yep, you guessed it, ladies and gentlemen. By the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. It turns out the governor of Oklahoma, Governor Keating, is also a very highly degreed Freemason and holds the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, which was conferred upon him by the Pope. The Voice of Freedom. to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. We now return you to the hour of the time. Back to the hour of the time, ladies and gentlemen. We now continue with the lecture given by Michelle Moore on August the 21st, 1996, at the annual Intelligence Service Skadi Convention, which was held in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, yeah. I don't know if he's ever been on Hilda's program. I don't think he has been. Yeah. Well, you're going to be seeing these guys. When I met Glenn Wilburn, before they imploded the building, I met him because I wanted to interview Edie about what the feds had told her about where the BATF agents were. And on May the 11th, Bill had world premiered the Parton Report on shortwave for the first time anywhere ever. 
And I had that information. And I was willing to trade that information for their information from the feds. So we stood in his front yard talking for over an hour. And he's a real nice man. And he was uh, very vulnerable emotionally. It was just, you know, real soon. The building hadn't come down yet. It was still there. It hadn't imploded it yet. And we were going to try to use the Parton Report and file amicus briefs and all kinds of things like this to stop the implosion of the building, the premature destruction of the crime scene. Uh, and so he was very, very interested in that information. He hadn't met John Cash yet. Um, we became fairly friendly. And for a time, um, there was this nice little circle of investigators doing work. It was Wilburn and Charles Key and me and Pat Riley and the Thorstenbergs and somebody else I forget now fell away pretty early on. And everybody shared every little piece of information with everybody else. And we all interviewed. There are some good parts of that videotape. Tony Garrett's testimony is very good and confirmed. Michael Hinton's testimony is very good and confirmed. Pat Barley's testimony is good and confirmed. And everything that came out of John Cash's mouth is a big lie, and we've proven it. And it's all in volume one of my book. But he, t he talked on that videotape more than any other person. Now, with Wilburn, his personality has completely changed. And his relationship with John Cash has changed him and his entire life. John Cash used to drive in from Idabel to do a few little interviews with some witnesses and survivors, rescuers or something like that, and stay in our motel, have dinner with the Wilburns and tell him what he's learned and then go back home. Gradually over a period of time, his encroachment, uh, he just swallowed the man up. Cash just swallowed up the family. He now lives in Wilburn's home almost exclusively and when you talk to Mr. Wilburn and you talk to Mr. Cash separately apart from one another when you can get them apart from one another about the same subject they will respond with the same phrases the same words the same inflection exactly I mean it's like turning on the robot and turning off the robot exactly the same words it's astounding so at this point I can't trust Cash, can't trust Wilburn, can't trust Key. Key thinks John Cash is the greatest investigator since Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Chuck Allen is very nervous about John Cash because he's very afraid of him and he is now withholding evidence from Key because he knows what Key knows, Wilburn knows, what Wilburn knows, Cash knows, what Cash knows disappears. Witnesses change their stories. Stories disappear. People don't want to talk anymore. Stories change. Oh, I wasn't really there. People disappear. So, see, there's a follow-up video that Chuck Allen's making. I don't know what the name of it's going to be. But uh, the information he's collecting for that, a lot of it he's sitting on privately. Now, I don't know how he's going to break it <laughs> to the powers that be that control the purse strings on those video productions when he's got all his footage ready to put together in the editing room. But he's not going to tell what he's got until the last minute because he's concerned what Cash will do with it. Cash is a real, real, real dangerous man. And uh, when we were planning the Oklahoma City What Happened video, David and I were invited to dinner out at the Thorstenbergs, and it was, it was a planning meeting. It was the first meeting. They decided they were going to do it. They'd gotten some money together. Chuck was going to uh, direct and produce and kind of work out a format, and Mrs. Thorstenberg was going to write the scripted parts and kind of put the screenplay together, and, and her husband, who fancies himself another, you know, Stravinsky, was going to do the score and blah, blah, blah. And David and I came away from the dinner and called Charles Key the next day and said, well, thank you very much for including us, but we wish to decline from the project. And the reason that we chose to decline from the project was because that at that time, which was August, let's see, May, June, July, August, four months after the... Bring it on! <laughs>
to see them. And they were American citizens anyway of Middle Eastern descent. But they could not see it, wouldn't see it, wouldn't even discuss it. And at that point we knew that uh, we didn't want our names associated with it. And the videotape, when it finally came out, Chuck, I, I got to see it, and I thought, oh, man. And Chuck called me up and said, hey, you think Bill Cooper will promote this on his program? I said, no, I'm sure he will not. So why not? It's a great video. Tell the truth. I said, no, it's not. He said, well, there's a lot of truth in that. I said, well, some. He said, well, what's the matter? I said, well, it's John Cash, you see. And over the next hour, I went through everything that John Cash had said on the videotape with Chuck and told him what the truth was and gave him all the evidence and the proof, just like we do in the book. Took it apart phrase by phrase. And when we were all done, his response was, well, can't he overlook that part? Because <laughs> he really wanted to sell these tapes. He had a lot of money spent on the project. And said, no, the John Cash appearance discredits the entire project. And you can't, you can't sell something that's only half good. Bill can't. I, that's why I didn't want to be a part of it, Chuck. And he still doesn't really understand that. It's supposed to be okay that Tony Garrett's information was good and Michael Hinton's information was good. But John Cash is the main star of the show. And he sits back there. <laughs> well, he did this and we interviewed that and they said that and of course it means this. Don't believe it. It's a bunch of bull. I want to talk to you about John Doe number three for a minute. American man who immediately after the bombing became the prime suspect, public enemy number one, and this is Roger O'Neill has his story to us. One hour and 41 minutes after the bomb exploded. But in fact, the search never did end. And ABC News has learned the FBI is still very much in the hunt for John Doe number two, based on the testimony of certain key eyewitnesses. In our investigation, we retraced the steps of FBI agents starting at the Ryder Truck Outlet in Junction City, Kansas, where two employees, including Tom Kissinger, continue to insist to federal agents that a second man was with Timothy McVeigh. There was somebody with him, yes. Looks like the sketch. Yeah. Kissinger's account is backed up by a former housekeeper at the Greenland Motel, Hilda Foster, who says she saw McVeigh there and a man similar to the sketch of John Doe Number 2 getting into a Ryder truck. He was walking... Do that to me, you know, when I was walking like this, he's coming, and then he just goes toward the truck. And beyond John Doe number two, there was also a John Doe number three, at least according to Jeff Davis, who delivered Chinese food to McVeigh's motel room on the night of April 15th last year. It wasn't the fair, it wasn't two, and it wasn't John Doe number two, it was a two. So ABC News hired leading sketch artist Gene Boylan who drew both John Doe number two as well as the Unabomber for the FBI. And we asked her to do something the FBI did not. Come up with a sketch of the man Jeff Davis says he saw in McVeigh's motel room. He's as, as, as real in the sketch as he was the dad, was it to him? 
And it's not McVeigh. It's not John Doe number two. It's an entirely different person that's out there somewhere. The testimony of these witnesses about other men who haven't been identified or even caught complicates but does not derail the case against McVeigh and Nichols. But federal authorities do admit that one year later, there is still a lot that is not known about who or how many were responsible for what happened here. Brian Ross, ABC News, Oklahoma City. You want me to run it back and look at it again? Does that look like Spiegelman to you? As well as the Unabomber for the FBI. And we asked her to do something the FBI did not. Come up with a sketch of the man Jeff Davis says he saw in McVeigh's motel room. He's a... Yeah, it's like she added big circles under his eyes, right? Number three, at least according to Jeff Davis, who delivered Chinese food to McVeigh's motel room on the night of April 15th last year. It wasn't McVeigh I delivered to, and it wasn't John Doe number two I delivered to. So ABC News hired leading sketch artist Gene Boylan, who drew both John Doe... ...for the FBI. And we asked her to do something the FBI did not. Come up with a... It wasn't the fair I delivered to, and it wasn't John Doe number two I delivered to. So ABC News hired leading sketch artist Gene Boylan, who drew both John Doe number two as well as the Unabomber for the FBI. And we asked her to do something the FBI did not. Come up with a sketch... hired leading sketch artist Gene Boylan, who drew both John Doe number two as well as the Unabomber for the FBI. And we asked her to do something the FBI did not. Come up. What was happening here, ladies and gentlemen, is we were watching the, the video and the sketch artist drawing the sketch of John Doe number three. Kaczynski. And uh, what happened is right before our eyes, she drew the sketch of John Doe number three, which was the exact twin of Kavinsky, who is the Unabomber. And that was an incredible discovery. You'll do the film grabber? Do what? I, I. So we're discussing now how we're going to treat this evidence and how we're going to take these sketches off the videotape in order to work with them more and uh, we are not ready to discuss our findings yet at this time however I can tell you that the sketch artist drew as John Doe number three an exact twin of the man who was arrested who is known universally as the Unabomber Incredible, you say? Ladies and gentlemen, there's absolutely nothing about the bombing of the Oklahoma City Mirror Federal Building that is not incredible. Before I leave the John Cash subject, um, the latest, oh yeah, I shouldn't bounce on that, the latest lie he's been caught in 
is there was a gathering, a sort of a reunion of rescuers and firefighters down to Myriad. And John Cash showed up wearing a camera, and he told Oklahoma City Police Officer Browning that he was a cameraman with NBC and that he had lived with James and Terry and Tim before the bombing. Well, that's news to James Nichols that John Cash ever lived with them before the bombing. I don't know why he told that story. Um, I don't know why he told Officer Browning that he was with NBC. I mean, the guy is known all over town. He's extremely well connected. For someone who's doing such dangerous work in uncovering the feds, he has an awful lot of federal friends who are helping him, cooperating with him. He's in Goody Goody with Lester Marks. He's a big shot with BATF in Dallas. He's in real good with the FBI in Oklahoma City. And the story goes that there was this terrible sting operation that went awry, and the FBI is tired of cleaning up the BATF's messes, and they want to let the BATF twist in the wind. And so John Cash goes on Chuck Carter's show a couple of weeks ago and says, well, I've been promised they're going to give me the true story here just any time. The FBI is promising this to John Cash? I don't think so. I just don't think so. So the only reason I wanted to cover Cash in detail like this was because you're going to see a lot of him. You're going to hear a lot of him. It, it's getting desperate. The feds are wrangling now. They've got some very big problems in the prosecution's case. And they've botched it bad. And I think they think they're going to lose. Yes? Yes. He hasn't written any books. He is on Harder Show. He, he promotes Oklahoma City, what happened all the time. Not a book, huh? But he does promote the video extensively. Yeah. They were there that morning. They expected the explosion to happen at 6 o'clock in the morning. They were there, the bomb squad, the ATF, the FBI, the police, fire department, everybody. They were all there, and nothing happened. They were around a couple hours, they all went home, the building blew up. Yeah, the bomb squad left between, uh, when did Nancy see them there? Norma went to work at 7.30, they were there at 8 o'clock, they were there at 8.30, they left, and the building blew up 32 minutes after they left. Yes, sir. What would that, uh, what would that do with your internal charges being there and it was supposed to go off at 6, start playing next week? Why didn't they find them and take them out? <laughs> So let, me, let me ask you a question this way. All this speculation and second guessing is useless. Every time we have this conference, a lot of time is taken up with that sort of stuff. We operate with facts. You do not speculate. You want to hear speculation. You do not start with a theory and try to keep our theory right. You have to cover facts. So now you know the true character of John Cash, and you've heard the kind of threats he made against Pat, who wanted to go public with the Gary Hunt information. And you know some of the theories, hypotheses that he propounds, all of which 
inure to the benefit of the prosecution. There's no theory or piece of evidence that he's allegedly manufactured or uncovered that has ever benefited the revealing of the truth of the situation. And every time there has been something come up that benefited the truth of the situation, he's done backflips to destroy that. Now he's trying to take down General Parton, trying to wipe him off the map, because he's going to be called as an expert witness for the defense. Or so the rumor goes. There have not been any witness lists released yet. But, I mean, you know, it's he will be called, I'm sure. I'm sure he will be called. Now, we've got a problem here um, with the militia connection. Of course, we know there wasn't a militia connection. But John Cash would like very much for there to be a militia connection. And that same militia has to be right-wing, white supremacist, extremist, uh, survivalist, gun-toting, neo-Nazi type. Has to be that to fit this nice little fantasy that he's built with Elohim City and Andrea Strassmeyer and, and Michael Brescia in Pennsylvania and all these other oddball characters. But you have to go farther back to when was McVeigh really arrested and by whom. Okay, the official story is that McVeigh was arrested by an Oklahoma State Highway Patrol trooper, troop guy, Charlie Hanger, 90 minutes, give or take a few, after the bombing on I-35 going north, uh, just outside of, um, I just blanked out on the name of the town. It's not the town they say. No. Uh, I want to say Billings. Billings. Close to Noble County. It's a 90-minute drive. I'm sorry? Perry. Yeah, but it's not Perry. It's, it's before you get to Perry. It's where he was stuck. I don't know. Marshall and Dillon. There's two little towns. One of them starts with a B. North on I-35 before you get to Perry. After Perry. 90 minutes from Oklahoma City North on I-35. Okay? <laughs> Just to be clear. And the story goes that they arrested him because he didn't have a tag on the back of the car. He didn't have any insurance verification in his car. He was carrying a concealed weapon. And then the story goes that he sat there in jail for several days while they flashed the sketches all over the world in the biggest manhunt in history for these two guys who supposedly blew up the building. And nobody puts the pieces together there in the Noble County Jail. Uh, and some friend of McVeigh's fingers him, calls the FBI and says, I know who that is. And somehow or another, the police guys in Noble County go, well, isn't that some guy we had back in that back cell? And then they notify the feds on Friday, the 21st, and sometime around 11 o'clock in the morning Eastern time, the feds move in, take the jurisdiction away, take the prisoner. And then we have this long wait while they're waiting for the media to gather, of course. And there may have been, well, that would be speculation. To move him out of the Noble County Jail to bring him to Tinker Air Force Base for the little hearing, which didn't make any sense either. That's what the story is. But the Sanilac County News in Michigan, City of Homes and Churches, great big newspaper, four pages long. Sanilac County News is a little community newspaper that's published near Decker, in Decker, where James Nichols' farm is. They report on Saturday, April 22nd, that federal authorities arrested Timothy James McVeigh on Wednesday, but he was arrested by state, or so the story goes. They said a friend of Terry Nichols, Tom McVeigh, was apprehended in Oklahoma. Now, where have we heard that name before? The book. 
Martin Keatings. See, I'm assuming this is a small-time newspaper. It's a typographical error, but isn't it an odd one to make? Because in, in so many paragraphs before, we've got Timothy James McVeigh, right as rain, perfect. But over here, a friend of Terry Nichols, Tom McVeigh, who's the, one, of the, one of the characters in uh, Final Jihad, written by the brother of the governor of the state of Oklahoma. Now, all of a sudden, our suspect is Tom McVeigh, was apprehended in Oklahoma. Then it says something very interesting. The Sanilac County drama began unfolding Thursday around 11 p.m. when the FBI contacted the Sheriff's Department. Federal officers began arriving in Sanilac County by 5 a.m. Friday. They set up a command post in the county conference room at Austin Street, Sandusky. According to Sheriff Virgil Strickler, Terry Nichols had joined a local militia group but was kicked out because his views were too radical. The feds were setting up to raid James Nichols' farm before the feds knew they had Tim McVeigh in the Perry County Jail, Noble County Jail, and they couldn't have put James Nichols into it at all without Tim. I didn't say that right, did I? Let me back up and try it again. The feds are setting up James before the feds know they have McVeigh. But they can't have James if they don't have McVeigh, because that's the only connection because McVeigh put down on his next of kin line on the jail card next of kin James Nichols. So we have a real big question when the feds were really moving. You can speculate a lot about what this means, but I personally do not believe that they didn't know they had McVeigh. I think they knew they had McVeigh long before McVeigh knew he'd been had. <laughs> Yes. Brought to you by Swiss America Trading. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to protect everything that you've accumulated from the work of the sweat of your brow, you need to have some real money because when this house of cards, this phony, counterfeit, deception, hoax, whatever you want to call it, when it all comes tumbling down around your ears, only those who have real money will survive that trial. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-BUY-COIN. Thank them for sponsoring the Hour of the Time. Tell them that you're a steady listener and you'll get red carpet treatment. I guarantee it. 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-BUY-COIN. Well, that's real interesting. We can sure talk about that. Um, well, see, we've got helicopters now on Wednesday and Friday. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on. We've got eyewitnesses who saw McVeigh stop by the side of I-35 at the time of the arrest. 
and hangar going over to the car and all these people standing around and a military helicopter dropping down out of the sky, landing, guys in military gear getting out, and then something happened. Must say, taken away in the chopper. From the place where the arrest occurred to the Noble County Jail, it's only a 15-minute drive. You don't need to chopper anybody in or out for no license plate, no insurance verification, and a concealed weapon. Then when the news was breaking on Friday, shortly before noon, see, it, it all happened in perfect sequence. First we get the breaking story about Noble County guys find out that they've got the prime suspect and the bombing in their own jail. They didn't even know it. So now we bring in the feds. At the same time that's happening, we've got the raid beginning in Decker, Michigan. That Noble County news breaks. About 30 minutes later, the Michigan Decker raid news breaks. And, oh, it all begins to tie in. When that McVeigh news was breaking, people were calling in KTOK and reporting a military-style helicopter parked on the sh shoulder of the road by the old yellow beat-up marquee with no tag. And a bunch of feds with the FBI and DATF jackets on waltzing around. They said it didn't look tense. They couldn't see anybody being arrested because allegedly the arrest took place two days before, which nobody knew at that time. But we got helicopters there of military origin and feds standing by the highway doing something to that car or doing something to one of possibly three different McVeigh's on Wednesday, the day of the alleged arrest, and on Friday, the day they decided to tell us about the alleged arrest. And I don't know what it means. Right. Possible years. Well, since McVeigh was down there in Waco selling those Is Your Church BATF approved bumper stickers, James Nichols thinks that's when they started surveilling them back up to Michigan. He had made him a nice target. So we have evidence existing of much, much foreknowledge on the part of the feds, a massive cover-up that the feds knew they had McVeigh from the beginning, that he was surveilled and photographed in Waco, that they were after James Nichols before they admitted that they knew they had McVeigh, that they were set up the night before they even told us anything about McVeigh, that we had military helicopters on the arrest site on Wednesday and Friday and at the Noble County Courthouse. We've got Dr. Lewis Jolly and West fl flying into Oklahoma City on the day he was moved from Tinker to El Reno and then showing up again the following September. Mastermind control, psychiatric experiment, brain fry guy. <laughs> His complete resume is in the appendices of the book. Dr. Lewis, 
Jollyon, J-O-L-Y-A-N, O-N, Jollyon West. Right. Yeah, he was on the psychiatric staff at OU in here in Norman for 15 years and did LSD experiments. Also, if you hear somebody talking about Jollyon, because they don't want people to talk about him, that's pretty strange. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Somebody asked me, oh, I needed to tell you too, there, the remanufacture of the seismic evidence is going to come up again. You're going to hear about this. Um, Dr. Raymond Brown over at Geologic Survey, is now, he has now been convinced that the feds have released to him the real original Omniplex record. I mean, here we go. We've already done this scene once. Now we're going to do it again. And uh, the excuse is that the Omniplex record that we've all seen, it's been published everywhere, the Veritas published first, that we got before the Fed sees the original. Well, the copy machine wasn't very good. And so where the blank lines are, the copy machine just didn't copy that ink very well. I mean, I'm telling you, this is the story. Bad copy machine. It's total bullshit. So you're going to see and hear new tales that the feds have released the actual real Omniflex seismic records and you're going to see all the lines drawn in and it's going to look like something else entirely. It's phony. It's fake. It's been manufactured. But they have convinced Dr. Brown that it's the real thing. And they have convinced his associates that it's the real thing. Okay, I want to play you one more little chunk of tape. Are you ready with the John Dale tape? I'll tell you when. Let me set it up. John Dale, for many, many years ago, was a talk show host on KTOK Radio, and he just owned Oklahoma City, greatly beloved by all. He's now a talk show, has a talk show on KFYI in Phoenix. And there was a great brouhaha about comments he made on his radio program a couple of weeks ago. And because his remarks were so offensive and got people so upset, they had to bring him in, I guess, by phone. No, he came in person to the studio to do a program with Carol Arnold on KTOK Radio where he discussed and defended his remarks. Now, I'm going to let you hear a little chunk of a tape, the piece of tape you're going to hear is from the alleged offensive show from Phoenix, and he's talking to a caller who called his program there. Okay, can you roll that? What's, what is it? Oh, skip it. I'll come back to it. Go to John Dale. Sorry about that, Brett. Hey, I'm a little bit confused. I heard you say earlier at the program, right at the beginning, uh, talking about Oklahoma City and mentioning that there weren't any innocent victims in Oklahoma City. No, I didn't say that. Uh, there, there's a gentleman called in on a car phone uh, that asked if, if I considered those to be uh, innocent victims. But I, did, I never said the children were not innocent victims. Uh, what about the adults? I don't consider them to be innocent victims, no. 
they're part, they're part of the system. Well, okay, let, let's say that you have a 25-year-old woman who's a mother of two. She's divorced and she's raising her kids and she doesn't want to go on welfare. So she gets a, she's a high school graduate and she goes to get a job as a secretary at the FBI or the BATF. Uh, and, and she dies in the bombing. Is she an innocent victim? Not in my opinion. Why? Because she's part of the system. She's part of the people that are uh, enforcing these laws that were and these, these agencies that we're all complaining about. She she is taking the money uh, from these people to go ahead and do and and to be their support personnel. It's just like this. Uh, you get in a combat situation as far as the military is concerned, and you got a guy back in the back area, and he's a crook. He he uh, he went through basic training. He had eight weeks. Uh, but he was going to be a cook and a baker. He never took heavy weapons. He never went on to finish, finish basic training with all the weapons training and whatever else. Artillery comes in and blows up his cook tent, and he and a whole bunch of cooks die. Are they innocent victims because they were non-combatants? No, they were support teams, and they were there, and they were they were keeping these guys alive up front. They were putting out supposedly hot meals or MR, uh, MRIs or whatever they are anymore. They call them... Uh, um, me, yeah, meals ready to eat. Me, uh, yeah, MREs or whatever else, you know. Okay, they're, well, are, they're, they're the support personnel. So are you saying that the FBI in Oklahoma City is comparable to the German military or, say, the North Vietnamese military? Uh, they're comparable to the American military. You mean in terms of being an enemy? They are, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, John great. Dale, former KQOK. Those comments as you can well imagine, sparked an awful lot of controversy all over Oklahoma City on both sides of the question. Because you had people saying, you know, let the victims get over it. We've, we've had enough. Let's just move on with life. And then uh, you had the other guy saying, well, yeah, the government is the enemy. And it was an act of war. I couldn't play it. The whole show was an hour long. I can't play it all to you. But the context was that the adult victims of the bombing were war casualties. Therefore, the only innocent victims in the bombing were the children because the government workers, whether they knew it or not, were the enemy. The enemy of who? The militias. See, this whole premise, this whole baloney thing with John Dale is based upon the premise that the militia, right-wing extremist, neo-Nazi, bad guy, white supremacist, I already said that, gun guys, did it. They didn't do it. If it was an act of war, it was an act of war perpetrated by the federal government against the American people, in which case, yeah, they were all innocent victims. They got it done to them bad. But they're not innocent victims because they're war casualties in a war of constitutionalists against the feds. So you have to, when you hear these controversial things, and they're a dime a dozen, love to get people stirred up, you've got to weigh what is the premise off of which they're operating. Remember when Dan was talking the other day about major premise, minor premise, conclusion. The major premise of John Dale's whole thing was that the militia right-wing extremists were responsible for it, and in their minds, they were doing a war act against the federal government, whom they considered to be the enemy. Second premise was that all those workers who work for the federal government are also the enemy and were war casualties. Therefore, they're war casualties, not innocent civilian victims. Big kill for the good guys or whatever. That's crap. The militias did not do it. The right-wing extremists didn't do it. They just didn't. We didn't do it. Even though John J. Nutter says, if we didn't, we probably wanted to. If we didn't, we probably could tomorrow. Maybe we're thinking about it. Maybe we wish we did it. I mean, you know, you guys, I think I'm getting bitter. <laughs> I want to. 
Anybody. It was done to us and to our country, and this is crap, but it's terrifically moving and emotionally very, very deep. And at the end, you watch, if you can see, the credits at the very end of the song, after the scene says, it says, Horse of Troy Productions. <laughs> okay? You know what I told you about Operation Trojan Horse? It's, it's real. <laughs> I haven't seen the album. Just a picture of his eye. No, no. Would you take the mic over there? Oh, thank you, Brett. Yeah. I can do this. No, I can't do it. Come back. Abdul is only primary win came last month in Delaware and in Arizona. Well, last time we were asking the question, what is the deal and where is Billy Tim? I think we are thinking of the people outside the community have helped. After you see it, I think you'll agree who did. Now the world broadcast premiere of Westbrook's newest video, a moving tribute to the victims, survivors, and rescue workers of the Oklahoma City bombing. We leave you this evening with the change. Yeah. 
it will not change me.
The Voice of Freedom. Freedom Radio Network.